Uh, hey, friends, wasn't that a great video? So encouraging to see all the sites. I'm Pastor Ray. I'm one of the pastors at Global Bayside, and we are thrilled you're here. But a lot of you are going, man, why are we doing this? Why am I watching Ray on video? Um, I'm going to do the introduction because this is a very special week around here, and it's part of the history of our church. Every year, we do a spiritual growth weekend, and we call all of God's people in our Bayside churches, all of you, to full devotion to Christ and to the three things that cause spiritual growth and will give you a great year with God, okay? Now, we'll get back to that in a second. I also wanna say this, you're part of a family and it's very exciting to be part of this family. Um, we have sites all over the place. Matter of fact, joining you today right now, Bayside in Folsom, y'all there Folsom, Bayside in Santa Rosa, Bayside in Davis, an amazing church there, Bayside at Adventure, and they've got a school there as well, Bayside Blue Oaks, Bayside Granite Bay, Bayside in Orange County, our newest church kicking off in two weeks is Bayside in Auburn, and the preview service in Auburn have run into six and 700. It's amazing start to what's going on in Auburn. And also, we have a Bayside in Folsom Prison. Let's hear it for him, okay? The, um, as a matter of fact, some of you, depending on how you live, that could be your future church, okay? Now, we're gathered here today to actually start taking spiritual growth seriously, and we have a verse of the year. It's on the screen. It's on your message notes. We will be dealing with this all year long, memorizing this all year long, and if you're going, why do we do a verse of the year? Why did we pick this verse? It is a great verse. It's Isaiah 41.10. I actually memorized it when I was in college, okay? Why did we pick this verse? You probably feel like me, okay? I have talked to a ton of people, and almost everybody said the same thing. It's a new year, and this is gonna be miserable. One guy said, it's a new year, this is gonna suck. I go, why? He goes, cause it's an election year, okay? And it's just gonna be miserable. An election year or any other year or every day will never be miserable if you're living in the presence of God on the power of God, with the promises of God. So we picked this verse for this year. Let's all say it out loud. This is an incredible verse. Here we go. Isaiah 41, 10. Do not fear. Why? For I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. And then, listen, he promised, I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Direct promise from God. For any of you going, oh, it's going to be a miserable year because of the election. I'm going, you read this verse, you go, not a chance. Why? Because when you're living on the promises of God, you can reverse the election. You can elect to live with joy and hope instead of anxiety and worry. You can elect this year to grow closer to God than you have ever been. You can elect to love everybody this year, even if they don't vote like you. Okay? You can elect to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to everyone, everywhere. You can elect that, okay? You can actually elect to believe what happens in your house is more important than what happens in the White House. Thank God. You can elect to let go of your past forever, begin a brand new start, and have the Spirit of God do things in your life you never imagined. And one of the things you can elect is this. We are in nine different churches. We're going to 10, 11, and 12. The great thing about having a team of churches like this, our pastors are united, our church is united, but when you band together, you have enough people that something major can happen. And this is the year we t are teaming up. We are are electing to raise a million dollars as a global church to, we're gonna keep it a dime of this, to build a hospital in Northern Nigeria, which will be the first children's hospital in the history of Nigeria in the Northern part of that country. Matter of fact, when you team up, you can elect to actually let's go change the world, okay? I actually believe this. This, when you start your year with God and you start your year by going, I'm gonna grow spiritually, this could be the best year of your life. However, it's all about making commitments and developing habits. I'm gonna say it again. It's about making commitments and developing habits. Hey, way to go, Folsom, okay? So I thought I'd start with something fun, okay? There is a book called The Really Important Survey of American Habits. Now, as I read this, you're gonna go, they don't sound that important, and you're right, okay? And they did a massive survey of people from every state in our country, and they asked them about their habits. So I thought what I would do is read these habits. You'll be raised your hands and voting, okay? And I thought we'd compare how to Bayside churches, no matter where you are, compare with sort of national trends. So 
first really important survey of American habits. Number one, when preparing a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, which goes on the top layer, peanut butter or jelly, okay? How many of you say peanut butter goes on the top? Okay, how many of you say jelly goes on the top? You win 96% of Americans, uh, most of you are cheering for yourself right now, okay? Now, do you store your socks rolled up or folded flat? Okay, how many of you roll them up? Okay, good, 51% of Americans. How many of you fold them flat? 41%, how many of you going, I don't do either, I just throw them in the drawer. Okay, look around, you'll spot these people, okay? Do you bite your fingernails? You ever bite your fingernails? Raise your hands. Okay, 96% of Americans. Now watch this. This is church. You got to be honest. So look around. If you've ever bitten your toenails, would you raise your hand? 25% of Americans do that. I couldn't do it if I tried. Okay. Now, another one. Um, if you drove here today, would you raise your hand? Okay, look around. Go over here today, raise your hand. Okay. When do you fill up your car? How many of you fill up your car? You know what? When it's like a quarter low, I fill it up. Okay, you just top it off. How many go now when it's about halfway, raise your hands, okay, halfway. How many go when it's about three quarters, like it's got a quarter tank, I go in and fill it up. How many of you are going when it's almost out of gas? That's when I raise your hand. How many are you going, well, I pretty much fill it up when it stops moving. Where are you, okay? Um, we'll see you in the parking lot with jumper kales. Okay? The other one is this, um, some of you couples are married. Who is, us who is usually late in your household? How many of you would say he is? How many of you would say she is? How many of you would say we both are? And how many of you are going, I haven't even arrived in church yet, so I didn't hear even the survey, okay? Um, that is a dumb bunch of habits, but we all have them, okay? And I just want to ask a really important, profound, spiritually deep question, and here it is, okay? Why is it that some people, they're just more effective than other people? Some people, they just seem to have more joy. They're more encouraged. Their hope level's higher. Some people, it's, it's like they have better friendships. Some people, they thrive. They flourish. Some people, they actually soar, while other people, they stay grounded and discouraged and never get airborne their entire life, okay? Why is that, okay? Or flip it to this. Why is it some parents just seem like parenting is a better experience for them? Okay? I mean, they're closer, they, they're nurtured. Why is it some parents just seem like they just get more out of parenting? Why is it some marriages are closer, seems like they're still in love, they build it sort of thing. Why, are, why is it some marriages flourish, some parents flourish, some people flourish? Why is that? By the way, same thing's true in the spiritual realm. Why is it that some Christians they just flourish, okay? Some Christians, they're just more effective than other Christians, say. Okay? They grow more, they enjoy God more, they have more answered prayer, they have an alive, dynamic, contagious, contagious face. Why is that? And there's, why is it, does God go down, I like you and I don't like you, so I'm gonna bless you and not you? No, God doesn't play favors. Why is it some Christians just having a more alive, dynamic, they got the faith you want? Why is that? I'm gonna give you the whole sermon in a sentence. If you're taking notes, write this down, this will change your life. Why are some people more effective? Because effective people commit to habits that ineffective people just don't commit to. Effective people are effective for one reason. They commit to habits that ineffective people don't commit to. I want to give you one more thing to write down. This will come up on the bottom of the screen. This is profound. If you actually really get this, this will change the rest of your life. You teach it to the kids, it will change the rest of life. Here it is. You actually don't decide your future. You don't decide your future. You decide your habits, and then your habits determine your future. I'm gonna say it one more time. You don't decide your future, you decide your habits, and then your habits determine your future. And what we're gonna do here in a minute, in a minute your pastor is gonna come out and unpack for you the three spiritual commitments, the three habits that are life-changing and life-transforming. Okay? The Bible uses the word transformation all the time. Okay, so we're gonna dive into the three commitments that every effective Christian in history has made, okay? These three things are what Billy Graham was committed to. These three things are what every New Testament Christian was committed to. These three things are what we're calling every single Christian that is anybody we get to speak to to make these three commitments. And if you're kind of going, what are they? Okay, what are these commitments? Number one is spend time with God. 
Number one is spend time with God. In other words, that's putting God first with my time. Second one is give a weekly tithe to God, just straight in obedience to the Bible. You'll hear more about that later, okay? That's putting God first with my money, okay? The third commitment is this, get connected in fellowship. It's worship, and it's a group, and build some relationships, and that's putting God first with people. So when, and here's the deal. When I spend time with God, when I give God a tithe and I'm unselfish and I'm generous, and when I connect with people, that is putting God first with my time and my money and my relationships. And folks, if God is first place in your time, money, and relationships, he's first place in my life. And if he's not, he's not first place no matter what I say. And the last thing I want to say is this. Um, this is a really cool thing to be able to do with you all, Okay. There is power unleashed when churches are unified. And our pastors are unified. We just got back from retreat. I mean, studied together, prayed together, dreamt together. Um, there is power when if sometimes one plus one is 15,000. I mean, it's amazing. Um, but what I want to say is this. I've been a pastor for a long time. <laughs> you can probably tell that looking at me. I've been a pastor for a long time. I mean, I'm in youth ministry. I've been in every conceivable setting. I've been a youth pastor. I've been an interim pastor. I've been a senior pastor for a long time. I ran an organization that was over 800 churches. I've been an, I've been an interim pastor at churches when they seem like they self-destructed. And, um, and so I've, I've been in almost every various setting I can get to. I've been doing this for over 40 years, okay? And what I want to say to you is this, the stuff that we're going to talk about today, if there was one last thing you would tell a Christian that's younger than you are, and fortunately for you, you all are, I would say this, if you will commit to these three habits, your future, your relationships, your family, your emotions are going to become every single thing, I'm getting choked up, every single thing God wants them to be. You can elect this year to live in the presence of God and the power of God. These habits are how you do it. All right, and now this is going to get much, much better. Folsom, would you give it up for Brian Hopkins? No, don't do that. Ah, stop it. Yeah. Come on, could we give it up for Pastor Ray and thank him for his vision and leadership around here? for all these years. My name is Brian, one of the pastors around here. Like Ray said, I, I'm teaming up to lead this church with my far superior co-pastor. His name is Brandon Short, and he's sitting right in the front row down here. Uh, and we welcome, yeah, we welcome every one of you, especially if this is one of your first times here. Welcome to being a part of the Bayside Folsom family. So glad you're here. All right, will you pull out your Bible uh, and your sermon notes? Pull out your Bible, your sermon notes page. Nobody moved when I said that. That's why I'm saying it. Your Bible, your sermon notes page, uh, your spiritual growth card. By the way, if you need one of these, hold your hand up right now, and our bouncers will bring you one. If you need any of that stuff, they'll bring it to you right. Yeah, the bouncers will bring it to you right now. Uh, get your regular pen. Get your Sharpie out. That's a lot to pull out. Sorry. Not sorry, because you're going to need uh, all of it. Have you ever noticed how, uh, keep your hands up, and they'll bring all that stuff to you. Seriously, don't, don't be shy. Just keep them up, and they'll bring it to you, because uh, you're going to need it all. Have you ever noticed how funny people are? Like, just people, like, I'm fun, right? We all, we all are. Let's just admit that about ourselves. And I was thinking this week, I was reflecting that there's these funny uh, superstitions that have become part of our life and part of our vernacular uh, for generation upon generation, uh, and we don't even know it. We don't even know where these things came from. I was doing a little reading this week and happened to run across the origin of where the phrase knock on wood came from. Who's used the phrase knock on wood? Yeah, a ton of us. Have, and I had no idea where it came from, right? It's just something you hear, and so it's something you say. And, and how do we use that? Well, the conversation goes like this. Someone comes up to you. They ask, how's it going? You say, what? It's going great. And then what do you say? Knock on wood. But, like, what does it mean? Where does that come from? So I, I found out. Some of you probably already know, but I'll, I'll tell you again. Picture northern Europe a few hundred years ago. Cultures, not only there, but also around the world, they, they worshipped and mythologized trees, right? They, they, they worshipped and mythologized trees, and why did they do that? They did it because they believed that trees 
were home to their variety of small g gods. And thus by touching the wood of a tree, the small g gods who lived in the trees would bring them favor and protection. Uh, The knock showed gratitude and would bring continued good fortune and blessing upon their lives. Like the small g gods who lived in the trees were always listening to everything everybody ever said. They could hear it all. So when someone asked you, how's it going? You would say, great, right? And then you would say, knock on wood. And then you'd go run out, find the nearest tree you could possibly find. And so that you could actually knock on it to get the small g gods attention so that they knew how grateful you were and so that everything would keep going great in your life. And we've just kept right on saying that little phrase, not knowing what it means or where it came from for like hundreds of years. And you're sitting here today going like, why in the world are you telling this us this, Brian? Because our verse of the year, Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10, is the beginning of a section of the Bible in the book of Isaiah where the one true living God, the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, thousands of years before that phrase, knock on wood, was part of anyone's vernacular, God Almighty himself was addressing some of the silly, superstitious beliefs of the nations and the people who were surrounding the nation people of Israel in that day. So the one true living God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Jacob, was sort of challenging their superstitious belief, challenging their, quote, faith that some of them were putting in their small g God, their idols, in the false gods that they were calling on, God Almighty calls them to account this sort of battle of the gods, where God was going, hey, when your life is going in a bad way, who do you want to call on for actual, real help in your life? Do you want to call on that little figurine that you carved out of wood or stone that can't speak, that can't change the course of anything, that can't predict the future, that can't give you wise and sustaining counsel, that can't frankly do anything at all except sit on a shelf and collect dust? Is that who you want to supposedly come and help you? Or do you want to call on the one true living God, the God who is the same yesterday and today and forever, the God who sustains his people, the God who has been sustaining his people since the very beginning of all time? Who would you rather have in your corner? And God says in this whole section of the book of Isaiah, He actually says about himself, I I am paramount. I am incomparable. No one surpasses me. I'm greater than all. And then we come to our verse of the year for 2024, us, our church, our community, right here. Isaiah 41, 10. God, right out of the shoots, what are the first two words he says? Fear not. Fear not. And there's a lot of stuff in this life and in this world that's causing us to fear in particular right now in this season, isn't there? There just is. Just turn on the news for a a minute. It's like, it's overwhelming, anxiety-inducing. And God just right out of the chute says, fear not. Fear not. Why? And then he actually backs up. He doesn't say, fear not, have fun with that. He says, fear not, for what? I am with you. He's actually with us. He's not just a a stone or a wood carving sitting on a shelf that collects dust and does nothing that you order your life around. It's like, come on, why don't you actually do something? God says, I'm actually with you. And you don't have to be dismayed anymore. Be not dismayed. You can think about all those people. Just imagine in your mind's eye, all these people who are ordering their life, praying to, calling out to a false God, an idol carved out of wood or carved out of stone, sitting on a shelf, and they wonder why nothing ever changes. How dismayed might they possibly be? God says, you don't have to be dismayed anymore because I'm with you. I I am your actual God. I'm your God, the one true living God, and, and I'll strengthen you. I'll actually strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. That's who God is. That's what he's going to do, just like he's been doing since the beginning of all time. You can trust him. You can actually trust him. You can put your faith in him. You can count on him now and for all of eternity. 
There was a little eight-year-old girl over in her kids' ministry class one Sunday that I heard about. She was praying with her class. The dang cutest little prayer you've ever heard. It went something like this. God, would you please bless our moms and our dads and our teachers and bless our pets? Oh, yeah. And bless our brothers and our sisters, too. Notice the pets came before the brothers and the sisters. You see how they write. And, and listen to what she said, the last line. This got me. And God, would you please take care of yourself? Because if anything happens to you, we're sunk, she said. And we chuckle and we go, ha ha, that, that's cute. A cute little prayer. But the truth is, nothing's going to happen to God. Nothing's going to happen to God. So, with all that in view of who God is, one true living God, the God who is calming our fears and working on our behalf, and with us, and strengthening us, and helping us, and upholding us in light of who he is. There's some commitments you heard Ray talk about in the video. Commitments that we make to him. Commitments that Christians for thousands of years of Orthodox Christianity have been making to him that we as Bayside Church, as the community of Bayside, have been making on this very weekend for almost 30 years now that we're actually inviting and challenging every single one of us to take these up, whether this is the first time or the 15th time or the 30th time we've done this, because you heard Ray say it, we don't decide our future. What we can decide, though, is our habits, and those habits are the things that determine our future. And so pull out your little card. It looks like this. Flip it over. The verse is on one side, and you're going to flip it over to the back. You can write these on your notes page. They'll be on the screens. Commitment number, number one is, what is it? A daily time with God. A daily time with God. Now, you've been around the church probably a little bit. Some of you have been around the church a lot. How many of you have been in a Christian setting before where some pastor, some Christian leader has told you you need to read your Bible more? How many of you have been in that? Oh, only three of you? Seriously. You're not, put your hand up if you've been in a setting where a pastor or a Christian. Yes, all of us have been in these settings. And so you think about me and what I have to do, like I have to tell people again to read their Bible. So I was reflecting and I was praying like, Lord, how do I do this, and, and I was thinking about it like this. You look around at our world, and you look around at our culture, and we would all admit that our world and our culture does a very amazing job of feeding all of our fleshly appetites, doesn't it? Would you agree with me about that? Right? World and culture, everything about it, media, and all, it just feeds our appetite. Actually, the author of 1 John says it brilliantly in 1 John 2.16. This will be on the screen. For everything in the world, right? It's, it's like he's actually looking forward to where we are sitting here a couple thousand years after he wrote this. For everything in the world, the, what is he, what's the, the what? The lust of the flesh, the, of the what? And the pride of what? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, not from God, but from the world. And so without even trying, our world and our culture that we're surrounded by 24-7, that we live in force feeds, is the only way I know how to say it, force feeds these lusty, fleshy, prideful appetites that are part of what it is to be human. And the author of 1 John says, these aren't from God. That stuff isn't from God. It's not from him. It doesn't come from him. But we're inundated by it. I don't even need to explain it to you because you just know what I'm talking about. It's, it's everywhere around us. The problem, though, is that our flesh, that this world and our culture is so very good at feeding is going to live for about 79 years. Did you know this? That's the average, 79 years is the average lifespan of the average Californian, 79 years. I did a little more research, and, and uh, for the average Montanan, it's 76.8 years, which is why I moved here from there, because I want to <laughs> live a little longer if I have a shot at it, right? So let's just say it this way. Our flesh is going to live for about 80 years. We'll just use round numbers. Is that okay if we just round off? Our flesh is going to live for about 80 years. And this world does an amazing, this culture does an amazing job of stuffing us full, feeding our lusty, fleshy, prideful appetites. But guys, that's just our flesh. That's just our flesh. 
that's not all we are. See, we're people. And yes, we have a flesh, but we also have a, what else do we have? We have a soul. And the only part of us that's going to live on forever in eternity is not our flesh. It's our, that's it. See, because our flesh is going to die, if you're an average Californian, around about 80 years old or so. And they're going to put you in a box, and they're going to take you out to the cemetery. They're going to dig a hole. They're going to throw the box in the hole. They're going to throw dirt on your face. They're going to go back to the church. They're going to eat potato salad and drink watered-down punch and share nice stories about your life. And that's how the flesh will end. But your soul is going to live on for the next Well, how long? Forever and ever and ever and ever. And guys, the only way you feed the only part of you that's going to live on forever and ever is by literally feeding on the word of God. That's it. Jesus said it magnificently in Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. Jesus answered, it is written. Man, and he doesn't just mean men, he actually means like humanity, all people shall not live on what? Not just bread. And you could actually insert your favorite food there if you so desire. Man, humanity shall not live on, say your favorite food. A lot of people said bread. You're like a carb-filled bunch of people, aren't you? You love your carbs. New year, new carbs right here, right? It is written, humanity shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And Jesus is saying, look, food will feed your flesh. Culture and this world will feed the fleshy, lusty, prideful parts of you. But only God's word is able to feed your soul. Guys, we have to feed our soul. And the only way that we counteract the gluttonous force feeding that this world and culture serves up to the lusty, fleshly, prideful appetites is by spending time with God and his word. That's the only way. Nothing else will do it every single day. And so will you just now, today, drive a stake in the ground and and just say, I'm going to start spending time. And and like if you haven't done it, if you're not reading the Bible regularly, Don't start by saying, I'm going to read an hour tomorrow. Don't do that. Like, start with five minutes and work, and then add a minute each day. Just start somewhere. And you can get an app. There's a million of them that'll help you do this. Get a Bible reading plan. There's a gazillion of them that'll help you. Uh, Get a chronological Bible in print, a one year chronological Bible, it's called. And you can just read every single day. It gives you the date. You read that little section, and by the end of the year, you'll have read the entirety of it. Just, just start and feed your soul and feed your soul and feed your soul because you're going to have it for the next billion years. Commitment number one is a daily time with God. Commitment number two is a, a lot of people's all time favorite a weekly tithe to God. Or you. You could mess with it a little and just say a a, a regular tithe to God. And this happens every time we talk about this in church. Uh, We run across people who want to argue and debate the tithe is giving 10% still applicable, et cetera, et cetera. And if you want to debate it, you could send an email to brandon.short at baysideonline.com. He loves receiving those. Love you, buddy. And, And over the years, I've been at this for 30 years or so. I've studied this thing a whole lot. And what is just unarguable is that Jesus talked about money more than he talked about any other subject. Quite literally. Go, you can go count the words, and it's just true. And the, in the New Testament, if you look at it, it seems to me that the 10% giving, the, the tithe giving, the 10% of your income, 10% of everything that comes into you increase, some 10% of the increase that arrives in your bank account is the floor of generosity, not the ceiling of generosity. You know what I mean? And guys, so we, we talk about this stuff, and it makes people really uncomfortable, and it causes a lot of us a lot of the time to have a lot of reasons not to give, come up with a lot of reasons not to give, to not be generous. Every single one of us has an extenuating circumstance or 10 of them. And what I found in my own life and what Dan and I have found in our own marriage is that right there when we're trying to excuse ourselves off of the hook of generosity 
That's the moment right there that the Lord loves to just, and he does it gently, put his finger in our chest and challenge us to, to just go, Brian, do you trust me enough to give at least 10% to building my kingdom? Because that's what it is. It's a trust thing. It's a faith in God thing. It's a, do I really believe all this stuff that I say I believe about God that he has me and cares for me? Do I really believe it? And you know who loves tithing more than anyone? And the, 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 the cynical bunch of people who hear that question say, oh yeah, pastors love tithing more than anyone. It's the pastors, it's not the pastors. Tithers love tither, tithing more than anyone. Because they see, we see, you see, if you've done it, you've experienced it again and again and again, all the ways that God shows up in their lives when they're faithful to God with their generosity. And I'm going to get real vulnerable and real candid with you. How in the world do you think that a pastor with 13 kids has survived and paid for raising 13 kids? How do you think that's even possible? Like people hear that and they're like, you guys are out of your mind. How do you think we've survived and pays for raising 13 kids? The answer is not my wife's amazing job. That is not, and, and she will tell you that. 1,000% she will tell you that. Guys, the only answer, the only explanation is tithing and beyond tithing and generosity. That's it. That's absolutely it. I'm going to get more vulnerable and I'm going to get more candid and this might make some of you very, very uncomfortable, but I'm just going to say it. Last year, 2023, we gave half of my salary back to Bayside. Almost the other half of it got given away to a bunch of other stuff that we care deeply about. And just in case you're wondering, that is substantially more than the tithe of our total income. And we're trying to increase it more in 2024 than we did in 2023. And we've seen the blessing of God in, in profound ways. And just remember, this is the only subject matter in all of Scripture that God says, what's he say about it? Test me in this. He says, like, try me and see if I don't pour out my blessings. And it's true. And it gets super risky to talk about this stuff because it gets really misunderstood and people misconstrue it. They think, oh, those guys, those pastors, that church, they must need money. They must be short money. Now, now honestly, we do have some significant challenges around here. I'm not going to pull any punches. We have some expensive challenges around here. Noah, our middle school pastor. Who's a fan of Noah, by the way, our middle school pastor around here? Yeah, I mean, Noah. Seriously, I love that Noah pastors all of our middle schoolers. I especially love that he pastors three of our middle schoolers. That's the entirety of the middle schoolers we have in our family at the moment. All of them he pastors. Noah called me earlier this week. He said, Brian, I don't know what to do. I got a problem. Listen to this. We have middle school small groups on Wednesday nights on this campus meeting outside in the rain on Wednesday nights. And I don't know what I should do about that. I desperately need more like roofed in indoor square footage. I was like, Noah, I'm so sorry I suck so badly at being a pastor that I don't have more square footage for you. Be because he's right. He does need more square footage. All of our ministries, frankly, need more square footage. Raise your hand if you think we need more parking around this place. Like seriously, like the parking lot. And we don't have an easy answer to solve that, but here's what we do know. Whatever the answer is that does solve it is going to require an increase in expenses. Could we just face up to that? It's just going to. And here's the thing. Tithing and being generous and you and me and us ordering our personal financial world around God's kingdom and God's priorities. We don't talk about it because God or Bayside needs our money. Let's be crystal clear. God does not need our money. God is not in a financial predicament ever. He's not having emergency financial meetings in heaven to discuss the latest interest rate increase by the Fed. Right? He, he just doesn't. But what is true is it's all his. 
all of the money that we call ours, it really is his. It's all his. And so th this isn't about raising money. It's about raising this little thing that Jesus tells us that we're supposed to be doing as the church, which is raising disciples, followers of Jesus, people who carry at the level of their souls the priorities and the order of the kingdom of God. A and you can't fake this. You can't fake giving and generosity in the church and in Christianity. Frankly, you can fake a lot of stuff, but you can't fake giving. You can't fake generosity. You either are or you aren't. No faking. And so God, I just ask you this question and this is like no obligation no pressure i'm just gonna make an invitation what if 2024 is your year to plunge headlong into the full-on 10 percent tithing deal what if 2024 is the year where you take that new step and you just say i, I i'm gonna do it all extenuating circumstances aside i'm i'm just gonna trust god test God, obey God. I'm going to do it. 10%, drive a stake in the ground today. I mean, and, and then for some of us who have maybe been tithing for a long time, what if this is your year, 2024 is your year, to take a new step and go above and beyond the tithe? Would you just be willing to trust God enough to take one of those steps of obedience and faith? And guys, you will not regret it. You will not regret it. If you want to work on it, you can text the word GIVE to 56316. It'll walk you through how to get that started. You can certainly automate it. That's how a bunch of people do it. Daily time with God, number one. Second commitment, weekly tithe to God or regular tithe to God. Commitment number three, we'll finish with this one. Being regularly involved in fellowship. In here and in another smaller setting. Uh, one time there was a little girl from a Christian family. She got really scared during one of those summer thunderstorms that they have in some parts of the country. And you know the ones where the thunder's so loud and the lightning's so bright and the clap of thunder clapped and a flash of lightning flashed like right outside of her bedroom window. And she got so scared and she jumped up out of her bed in the middle of the night and she ran into her mom and dad's room and she jumped up on her mom and dad's bed and grabbed her mom and held her so close. And her mom said, sweetie, it's okay. I've told you in times like this, you don't have to be afraid. God's with you. You can pray. He'll answer you. He's always there. And the little girl's like, Mom, I know that. I believe that. But at times like this, I need someone with skin on, she said. Times like this, I need someone with skin on. Because see, what's true is the verse of the year. Isaiah 41.10, fear not, for I'm with you. God is with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. He's our God. He will strengthen us. He will help us. He will uphold us with his righteous right hand. And sometimes, I dare say a lot of times, good times, hard times, we just need someone with skin on, don't we? Someone to be the hands and feet of Jesus with God, with us in that moment which is why being here on a weekend, also being in a smaller setting, a Bible study, a small group, a Celebrate Recovery step study, a Celebrate Recovery regular gathering here every single Tuesday night, all of those gatherings matter so much. Because someone needs us, and we need someone. Yes, God's there. Yes, God's got you. Of course he does. And we need us and him together. You can go right out those doors when we're done in here. You can go right up to the small group table, set up right in the middle of the lot. You'll trip on it on your way out, and you can help get, con they'll help you get connected with a group today. You can text, text full groups, F-O-L groups, to 56316, and they'll help connect you. Y'all got your card? Anyone still need one? The bouncers would love to bring you one if you don't. Pull out your card, pull out your Sharpie, and guys, would you, more than just signing this, more than just saying, yeah, I'm going to do this because everyone else is doing this, and that guy on the stage is telling me to do this, would, would you just like today, right now, right here, cement your decision. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pursue a daily time with God. I'm going to feed my soul, the only part of me that's going to live on forever and ever. 
a weekly or a regular tithe to God. I'm just going to order my personal financial world around God and his kingdom and his priorities, and I'm just going to, I'm going to do the 10% thing, and maybe some of us are going to do the more than 10% thing. A daily time with God, a weekly tithe to God, and then I'm going to be regularly involved in fellowship. I'm going to be here on the weekend, and I'm going to be in a smaller setting, a Bible study, a small group, in some setting. Not just rows, but in a circle, looking eyeball to eyeball with somebody. And so I just invite you to pull that cap off your pen and you just drive that stake in the ground. You and G, I'm in. I'm in and let's sign these things together. And then let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much that you love us enough to gracefully extend your work to us in our lives. Your, your saving work that rescues us from the mess that I made of my life and so much more. And Jesus, I pray for us that we would actually dig into these commitments, that they would be like reflexive for us, like the inhale and exhale that is breathing, Jesus. We're going to spend time with you. We're going to feed our soul. We're going to give back to you, frankly, what's already yours via the tithe, maybe even more. And then we're going to be in a small group. We're going to be in fellowship beyond just showing up on the, yeah, we're going to show up on the weekend. Of course we are. We're going to be here but we're also going to meet in a circle because we need somebody and somebody needs us with you right in the middle of that. And God, that all those things, it's not a formula, but that it would be transformative in our hearts and in our lives. And that we'd look back a year from now and go like, wow, look at everything God's done again not through a formula but because we're loving you we're pursuing you we're serving you we're ordering our priorities around you we're investing in people with you God help us do that we love you Jesus it's in your name we pray this and everyone agreed and said amen